Chapter 1. The art crits at Raybury were legendary and often lasted from 10 in the morning till midnight or later. Daniel Ballantyne was regarded as one of the school's star pupils with an exceptional flair for analysis and discourse. The tutors were all poseurs, aside from two poseus. But I was smart enough to play them at their own game. I learned nothing at art school except how to defecate like a bull and tell lies. He was a working-class boy with a chip on his shoulder. I worked hard on my accent. I got rid of the bow bells. My mum and dad disowned me. They said I was a toffee-nosed git. I've got a brother, you know. He runs a car dealership in Stepney. I know. I've spoken to him. And what did he say about me? Well, um, <laughs> it was a complex discourse and difficult to summarise without traducing you. But in a phrase, he said you were up yourself. Did he now? Huh. Well, you know, Mum and Dad were so proud when they sent me to Wormwood Scrubs because that's where Reggie Cray did time. And then, soon after leaving art school, Ballantyne met Gilbert Reynolds. He was a drunk. The two men became firm friends. He wanted me. I was quite a pretty boy, you know, but I didn't swing that way. Not there. Ballantyne enjoyed a bacchanalian existence in the Soho demimonde. It was a mad time. I once crawled the whole length of Frith Street because I was so drunk I forgot how to use my legs. <laughs> <laughs> but Gilbert was kind to me. He taught me so much. But he was jealous of you, wasn't he? According Why would he be jealous of me? I'm just a... just a hack. He was a great artist, a genius. But there are some who say your early work was very promising and that Reynolds... Have you seen my early work? Well, no, hardly anyone has. Derivative, but... puerile, vapid, mediocre. That's what drove me to crime. My best friend was a genius and I was a hack. That's when I suffered my first nervous breakdown. You had a nervous breakdown? I was incapacitated for months. I saw no... You must know this. Uh, no, I, I don't. Tell me more. It was after Gilbert died. He drank himself to death, stupid sot. A light went out of all of our lives. I started having panic attacks. I ran out of money and got kicked out of my flat. I, I slept on floors for six months until, well, that's when it started. You sold the Gilbert Reynolds. It was a caricature of me drawn on a napkin, signed Gilbert. I sold it for five grand. That was a fortune in those days. It was like a Picasso doodle. The galleries went wild for it. And that was your first forgery? Yes, yes, it was. So, well, what's he like? Rather sad, actually. Melancholy sad or pathetic sad? Dying of cancer after two years in jail, sad. Ooh. <laughs> I mean, he's always been a great hero. He's a criminal, Ben. He's a forger. Where's the harm? I will explain all in Chapter 11. I'm sure you will. <laughs> I mean, the thing that puzzles me is, though, if he has all that talent, why didn't he have a career of his and own? Indeed, and indeed, why don't you? Touché. I'm oh, sorry, I, I didn't mean to... No, you're right. I mean, it's two years since I've sold the canvas, but I do make one hell of a barista. Ouch. When he was 17 years old, August began to hear voices, and he was committed to an asylum. <laughs> he was never once visited by any member of his family. Auguste Reynard was at one time considered to be the greatest outsider artist of the 20th century. The Apocalypse in Paris was his masterpiece. It sold for 22,500,000 francs in 1983. The style of Apocalypse is naive, brightly coloured, fauvist. The detail is extraordinary. And the centrepiece of the painting is a sunset shaped to look like a man's heart. I used a life model, of course. I had a deal with a mortuary attendant at a local hospital. Shadows are walking in the streets below. There was an August Reynard. He did spend his life in a psychiatric hospital. The sunset is raining blood on them. He committed suicide in 1927. That much was true. The blood has teeth. The rest I invented. The teeth have tears. I created a false provenance. 
letters from Jean de Buffet to Renard, articles in the French press about this artistic phenomenon, mocked up on an old printing press with aged paper. Everyone checks the brushwork. No one thinks to check old newspapers. And the shadows have souls. It is an amazingly sophisticated fraud which could justly be considered a metatext. For it is the forgery of a painting that does not exist by an artist who never lived. I intended it as a joke, really. But it all got out of hand. Ballantyne often claims he was just an impractical artist, taken advantage of by slick operators. He was, however, a shrewd businessman who made a considerable fortune from his fakery. Do I hear 500? 600 to the lady at the back. Seven? Eight. It is not with you, sir. 900 to the gentleman at the aisle. Are we done? I'm selling for £900,000 to the gentleman in the red tie. And now a rarity. View from St Ives by Francis Bacon. What am I bid? Mm, I'm, I'm not sure I care to be part of this project. I do sit down. It's art history, not hagiography. Mm, that wretched painting was the centrepiece of our School of London room for nearly five years. Even now I get visitors complaining because it's no longer hanging there, <laughs> next to Miss Muriel Belcher. Mm -hmm. I'll start the bidding at 500. Do I hear 500? 600? 700 to the gentleman in the middle. 800 to Alison's bidder on the phone for this exceptional view of the bar in the Eagle's Nest pub in St Ives. The colours were richer. Bacon came into his own stylistically in St Ives, you know. He spent seven months there in all. Mostly in the pub. Mm -hmm. The painting just seemed to encapsulate all the paradoxes of the man. A burning Christmas pudding, a man with no face screaming. That's Patrick Henry. Indeed. And Bacon was the man being whipped with a belt in the snug. I loved it because it had all Bacon's madness combined with a delicious sense of humour. That should have tipped me off. It was a fake. Of course, Bacon had no sense of humour. Nine hundred. One million. One million one. One million two. One million three. Are we done? I'm selling for one million three hundred thousand pounds to the lady with that delightful hat. One of the theses of my book is that Ballantyne could have been one of the greatest artists of oh, our time. Oh, not didn't. this dreary old canal. It just seems to me... Yes, that... yes. Is that thing recording? Yes. Well, let me explain it to you. Daniel Ballantyne is a highly proficient painter. No one can deny that. An exceptional sculptor. He's even forged jewellery and mosaics. He can do Picasso. He can do Bacon, as I know to my cost. He can do Mondrian. He can copy vision. Yes, but does he have vision? No. This is what you people don't understand. Picasso invented Picasso. Rembrandt worked hard to become Rembrandt. Vermeer originated the Vermeer. Copying is one thing, pastiching is another. But originality, that's a gift from God. Well, not literally God. I admit the man has talent. Most forgers are second-rate. Van Meegeren's Vermeers are a joke when you look at them closely. But Ballantyne, well, he really can paint. But he has no soul. He has no truth. No access to the valves of feeling. He's just a jumped-up spiv. Right. What do you think? Um, who's it? I didn't ask that. I asked, what do you think? It's striking. You don't like it? Oh, I do. It, it's rather good. Is it Leon Kossoff? Hardly. Well, the colours are superb. Roy de Maestra. When did this become a guessing game? <laughs> My first guess was Gilbert Reynolds, but it's too... It's, it's, it's too... This is not a forgery, is it? This is a Daniel Ballantyne. It is a Daniel oh. Ballantyne. I've started painting oh, again. That's wonderful. I'm so... And I only have another six months. Oh. I felt it was time I indulged my own talent. Daniel, I'm genuinely thrilled. You might even want to write a chapter about it. Of course I will. Of course I will. And you can keep it. Here. Oh. It's yours. 
<laughs> it's my gift to you. And I'm so delighted that you think it's rather good. So, how is the old fraud? He's fading fast. Yeah. I wonder when you come to see me. I was his nemesis, you know. I've spoken to him about you. He bears no ill will. Well, he should. I spent most of my career trying to find him and lock him up. For years, we didn't know his name. We just knew him by his work. He's a clever man. Must be disappointing for you that you weren't in at the kill. No, oh, I've moved on. I work for insurance companies now, recovering stolen artworks. Let me just... Uh... Interview with Andrew Gerald, 14th May. Andrew, can you tell me how you first became aware professionally of Daniel Ballantyne? Maybe I can, maybe I can't. Depends. On? Our deal. What deal? A mutual... Back scratch deal. Switch that thing off. Now, there are some questions I want you to ask Ballantyne. Is this connected to one of your current cases? It is. A forgery, then? Which artist? No, not a forgery. A robbery. The Van Rijn Museum in Amsterdam three years ago. What's that got to do with Daniel Ballantyne? We think he was behind it. He planned it hired the robbers and sold the paintings off to crooked auction houses. <laughs> you almost had me going there. Ballantyne is not... He is. Forget the lovable forger angle. I've been trailing Daniel Ballantyne for 20 years. He's a major career criminal, an art thief, and a murderer. No, he's just a sweet Here, over the hill. Take old... a look at this, Jessica. It's hate mail. Yes. It's a letter written by Daniel Ballantyne to his old friend Gilbert Reynolds, threatening to kill him. Now, look at this one. A pathology report. Gilbert Anthony Reynolds. And look at the pathologist's conclusions, last paragraph. Morphine overdose may have been administered in alcohol. <sighs> well, no one takes morphine in alcohol. That's why they invented needles. Are you seriously suggesting that... Gilbert Reynolds. Arguably the greatest British artist of the post-war period drank himself to death. Or did he? You know who was with Reynolds that night? The night of the pub crawl that ended in his death? Daniel Ballantyne. He had motive and opportunity, and I'm telling you, he did it. Ballantyne is a liar and a thief, and he's also a murderer. And why are you telling me all this? Because he trusts you. I want you to work with me, Jessica. To trace and recover the paintings Ballantyne stole. And when you're done, you can write the whole story up in your book. It'll make your reputation. And the world of art will be in your debt. So what do you say? Are you with me, Jessica? You want me to be a... What? A grass? Yes or no? Chapter 4. It was an exhilarating time for the young, naive, yet ambitious Ballantyne. Seduced and inspired as he was by the aging enfant terrible of British art, Gilbert Reynolds. I was 17 years old, a teetotal, and Gilbert and the others were drunk all the time, and eloquent, and passionate, and quite, quite mad. Reynolds was the focus of a diverse salon of intellectuals, gangsters, drunks and society beauties. I don't think Daniel Ballantyne paid much attention to me, to be honest. He was so... Claire de Vere, who later became a celebrated children's author, was the Guinevere of this court. Besotted with Gilbert. Were they lovers? Is this going to be one of those sleazy kiss-and-tell books by any chance? Oh, no, absolutely not. My theme is... What is reality, as reflected through the story of a forger of the real? Well, that does sound thrilling. You've seen me naked, I take it? Um, yes, I have. I was far more beautiful than that, and trust me, I never had more than two breasts. <laughs> yes, Gilbert did sleep with Daniel Ballantyne once, but it didn't go well. Oh, tell me more. I think poor old Mr. Reynolds fell asleep. That might have been the drink. 
And what was Ballantyne's original work like? Oh, I couldn't say, really. His first show was cancelled. I never saw much of his work. And why was the show cancelled? Well, I've no idea. You'll have to ask Daniel. He told me he was so disgusted at his own mediocrity, he destroyed every single painting. Hmm. I haven't seen Daniel in so many years. He vanished, you see, soon after Gilbert rather stupidly drank himself to death. Then years went by without a word from him until I heard he'd bought a villa in Ravello and was living the life of Riley. Did you know he was forging artworks? Of course not. How could I know? And is it true that Ballantyne once sent a letter to Reynolds threatening to kill him? Yes, that's true. And is it... I think I've said all I care to say. There is evidence that Ballantyne may have poisoned Gilbert Reynolds in the course of that long pub crawl. Would you care to comment? No, I would not. She just clammed up, turned to stone on me. Well, that's no surprise. The fix was in a long time ago. Should I confront her with a pathologist's report? That might scare her into telling the truth. No, there's no point, Jessica. We'll never prove Ballantyne committed murder, not after all this time. So, let's focus on the Van Rijn robbery. Okay, if you say so. April 22nd, 2006. Two armed robbers stormed the building, 12 artworks stolen, including a de Kooning. That's what puzzles me. The museum was stacked full of priceless Rembrandts. Why not steal those? Too recognisable. But the lesser-known pieces, an obscure Chagall tapestry, a little known to Cooning, that's much easier. And that's why the thieves needed Ballantyne. He could pick the pieces they could sell. Chapter 7. Ballantyne might by now have been reminded of Edgar's words, And worst I may be yet, the worst is not, so long as we can say this is the worst. Because three weeks after the German police released him on bail, the Kandinsky Blue Blue at the Vanderbilt Museum in Barcelona was exposed as a second-rate Ballantine forgery. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Are you really going to write this? Why? What's the problem? Well, firstly... <coughs> Are you OK? <coughs> You're looking pale. I've been better. <coughs> Just give me a... Yum. Give me a moment. <sighs> All right. Two problems. Firstly, that quote from Lear is such a cliché. I don't have to show you these chapters, you know. Secondly, in point of fact, you're wrong. The Kandinsky was not a second-rate forgery. I've read the reports. The forger used acrylic. And you think that I would have made a mistake as elementary as that? But you were convicted for the Kandinsky forgery. And I was guilty as charged. But if I'd intended the forgery to pass undetected, I would have done a better job. So you did forge the Kandinsky? Yes, I did. But deliberately badly. Oh, do try and keep up. All right, all right. Can I ask why? So what you found out? Well, he didn't mention the Van Rijn Museum job, but he did admit to an earlier robbery. The Kandinsky Blue Blue. He stole it from the Vanderbilt. <sighs> but... We all believe the Blue Blue was a forgery by Ballantyne. He confessed to it at his trial. But you see... The painting they originally had was, well, the original. And Ballantyne stole it and left behind a fake. Oh. You see, Ballantyne knew the security of the Vanderbilt was state-of-the-art. So he phoned them up, pretending to be an FBI agent, and said their Kandinsky was a forgery. <laughs> so they moved the painting to their restorer's workshop to authenticate it. Ballantyne and his men broke in at the dead of night and stole it and replaced it with a fake just for the hell of it. <laughs> Who was on his team for the actual robbery? He didn't say. Well, well who was his buyer? Uh, he didn't say that either. Hmm. But don't worry, Andrew, I'll find out. You can rely on me. <coughs> Daniel? <coughs> Should I call a doctor? Oh, no, I'm allergic to oil paint. Would you believe that? Irony of ironies. We should stop now. <coughs> I'll be fine. I never, ever thought <coughs> that I would be un unable to paint. Then, can we talk a little more about the Kandinsky robbery? 
I should never have told you about that. Whatever possessed you? Money. <laughs> Who paid you? A rich man. A rich man with a very shady background. He wanted that painting as a gift for his wife, so he got it. <laughs> and what was his name? <laughs> I can't tell you that. Well, what have you got to lose? After all, you owe it to posterity. Please, Daniel. For me? Andrew? It's Jessica. He hasn't got long. I think he wants to purge his conscience. Yes, yes, I do know how to... Yes, it'll all be recorded. I'm seeing him again tomorrow. Okay. Am I going to regret this? Think of it as rescuing great works of art. <laughs> right. The buyer's name. <clears throat> it was Carlo Ducci. He was a capo with the New Jersey mob. And it was his wife, who and the best of Marcus Grant, the tobacco millionaire, who asked us and to find well him. Some we also took two Chagas. A Russian oligarch was the client for those, and also for and the. As we were leaving the gallery, to my astonishment, they shot at us, and we, we shot back! <laughs> How am I doing? Great. This is. It's extraordinary. It's just so. Oh, well, normally, you see, I, I write rather dry, scholarly books. <laughs> this is a departure for me. Yes, your books are a little on the arid side. Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, but um, you do write like an angel. Oh, too kind, <laughs> Daniel. <coughs> One last thing. Can you tell me about the night that Gilbert Reynolds died? Why are you asking me about that? Are you there? No. He died at home. We carried him back to his place, dead drunk, and we left him there. The post-mortem shows there was morphine in his bloodstream. Was Reynolds an addict? Good Lord, no. What are you... You think I killed him? Did you? How dare Please you? cut the crap, Daniel. Did you kill Gilbert Reynolds? Oh, my dear, sweet, charming thing. Yes. I poisoned him. He was hateful to me, you know. He slept with me once. And he mocked me afterwards, and so I decided I would teach him a lesson. He was drunk that night. They all were, of course, but... Not me. We started in Wheeler's and went around the usual haunts, and I spiked his drink. I, I think he died in the taxi cab, but I pretended he was alive when we carried him up the stairs. And we left him with Claire. Dear Claire. Yes. I murdered Gilbert Reynolds. You know I have to talk to the police about this. Why? <laughs> I'll be dead soon. <laughs> you just put it all in your book, my sweet. I will. Good. And I know you'll do my story justice. The world will know the truth. And you, Jessica Brown, you shall be famous. Why the urgency? I am being lied to. I know it. I'm being duped. And how is that my problem? Valentine has confessed to the murder of Gilbert Reynolds. That's nonsense. Gilbert wasn't... He... Oh, wait. Come in. Through here... Sit down. You want the truth. There was no legendary last pub crawl. His friends lied to protect his name. 
Gilbert died at home. He drank a bottle of whiskey with morphine dissolved in it. I found him in the early hours of the morning. He left a sad, sad note. I have it still. It was suicide. But why would Valentine confess to a crime he didn't commit? Wishful thinking, perhaps. You don't know, do you? Know what? About Daniel. The truth about Daniel Valentine. He was... Well, I've never known such a talent. His early work was sublime. Soul-searing, yet tender. A select few of us were allowed an advanced view of his work, and a week before the exhibition opened, all those paintings were sold. Gilbert bought them all. And the day before the press preview, he drove Daniel out to the woods and there were some men waiting. Old-fashioned East End villains, the kind Gilbert used to drink with. They built a bonfire. They threw each of the twelve paintings on the fire. Gilbert, you see, couldn't bear to be bested by a protégé. And I was there. I watched and I thought, uh, well, at the time, I thought it was funny. Gilbert bragged about it for months afterwards, but I think he regretted what he did. Twelve months later, he committed suicide. Was that regret? Daniel was destroyed. Gilbert was dead. No longer seemed so funny. But I kept the secret all these years. Why did Daniel confess to murdering Gilbert Reynolds? I don't know, but I can guess. It was the one thing in the world he most wanted to do. And he never had the nerve to do it. Chapter 10 When I began writing this book, the question uppermost in my mind was why. You think it will be easy to forge a Jackson Pollock, but that's not so. Daniel Ballantyne is a man of undeniable talent, so why squander his gifts on a life of crime? I was hired by some wise guys to authenticate a Pollock that had been taken from a New York gallery. The deal had been struck, but the Italians weren't going to pay out unless I could tell them it was a guaranteed genuine Jack the Dripper. But after spending so much time in his company, the truth became clear to me. Ballantyne is an obsessive, remorseless, pathological liar. So there I was, looking at the paints, the white oil, the black enamel, modern paints from circa 1973. He lies to himself as well as to the world. The impasto was like peanut butter. You could see the trowel and the stick marks amongst the splash and the dribble. But it's the canvas that was the key. That's where Pollock forges generally go wrong. Always it's of the highest quality and stretched after the painting was finished. He is, in short, a master of deceit. But is he also a murderer? Well, I gave the painting the thumbs up. It was rather a wonderful piece, to be honest. Twilight at sea reminded me a little of Full Fathom Five. I love Pollock, but I've never forged <laughs> one. I guess that I just don't like that much mess. How's your daughter, Daniel? What? Your daughter. It's her birthday today. Did you send her a card? Are you trying to provoke me? I thought I was um, explaining to you how I got into the art robbery racket. Did you I... send Michelle a card? Yes, I did, and I sent a letter to her mother explaining once again that I am going to die soon. But, you know, she hates me, with good cause, I might add, so Michelle will never see the birthday card. And my heart is broken. Are you happy now? Why should I be happy? <laughs> because, because you've got another sensational chapter for your putrid little book. Sad old forger never sees his daughter. You're going to make me look pathetic, aren't you? I tell it the way I see it. So how old is the daughter? Fourteen today. 
and she's the key to it. The police seized Ballantyne's assets four years ago, so when he's dead, there'll be nothing to leave his daughter. No reason to ever remember him. Hence the book. Hence the book. He negotiated a share of the royalties in return for a full disclosure of his life and crimes, and he's transferred his share to a trust to be paid to his daughter when she reaches the age of 18. But let's face it, she's not going to get rich on the back of a Jessica Brown scholarly hardback. And that's why he lied about murdering Gilbert Reynolds. It must be. Because it makes one hell of a story. A devious bastard. He's tricking me into writing a bestseller. And Gerald is in it with him. Oh, and what about the other stuff? The mafia links, the art robberies? Mostly true, according to someone in Interpol. Forgery was the tip of the iceberg. What are you going to do? I don't know. Well, have you confronted him? No, he's a liar. He just told me more lies. And, of course, he might pull out of the book deal. Good. <laughs> That's what you want. You have to go to your publisher, cancel the book. Jess? I, I need to think. About what? You have to walk away. Do I? Yes, I mean, Ballantyne lied it's to you. It's the He's... one thing, Ben. What? The one thing that will make the book a hit and make us rich. Oh, very funny. I'm not kidding. Between us, we're barely scraping by. I write books that no one reads. You sell lattes and cappuccinos with paint under your fingernails. Come on, we don't need to dissenter, you know, this. Don't we? Ben, I'd like... What? A house, garden, baby. What? You want to sell your soul to have a baby? Yes, Principles, whoosh, there they went out the window. <sighs> Jess, I can't believe what? that you... That didn't... I'm smart enough to play Ballantyne at his own game. You don't know me, Ben. You don't know me. You're scaring me, Jess. Good, I'm glad. Because this is it. This is my moment. I know how to do this. I've written the chapter and it's brilliant. Full of eloquently ambiguous prose. Was it suicide? Is Ballantyne making a false confession? Or is it murder most bloody after all? I allege nothing, but I milk every sensational possibility. I'm writing like a whore, and do you know what? I'm enjoying it. A dealer can make or break an artist. It's a relationship that is exceptionally... If someone stole a famous painting, who would buy it? I'm sorry? I'm talking Monk's Scream, Picasso's Man with a Purple Hat. I've been told it's impossible to sell such pieces on the open market, but is that true? Are there rich people who keep these paintings on their walls even though no one else can ever see them? Allegedly. And do these rich people pay professional criminals to steal to order? I really couldn't answer that question. Well, because you don't know or because you do know? Let me put it this way, Jessica. If I were richer than I am, and had fewer scruples than I do, and was not in the habit of inviting people to dinner parties at my home, as is in fact my wont, would I fill my walls with masterpieces of stolen art? That's the question I would dearly love to have asked. What's the answer? The answer is yes. Art is a drug, Jessica. It is crack cocaine on canvas. Burger, medium, bacon and cheese, fries, pint of lager. Thank you, madam. Caesar salad and a sparkling water, please. No problem. Why did you lie to me, Andrew? What? Ballantyne didn't kill Gilbert Reynolds. Uh, it was suicide and you know it. I may have gilded the lily a little. I, I wanted you on my side. I thought that would swing it. And you knew Ballantyne would back your story up? Well, I guessed he might. The man's a born liar. Look, I'm sorry Don't that I Don't apologise. It serves no purpose. I no longer believe a word you say. Fair enough. But we still have a deal, right? No, we don't. Do you know an artist called Emile Lecomte? No more questions, please. The sole purpose of this lunch is for me to rub your nose in your own audio. There was a Lecomte stolen from the Van Rijn Museum. Low life. I think Ballantyne has it. 
I want you to find out where it is. Try and win him round. Use your Stop! Power. Get this through your thick skull. There is nothing that could ever induce me to ever trust you again. You reckon? Take this piece of paper. And write some numbers on it. Here. Here's a pen. Numbers? Sort code. Account number. A hundred thousand pounds. Enough for a holiday. And an exhibition for that rather talented boyfriend of yours. Are you serious? Of course I'm serious. That painting is valuable. My insurance company are only too happy to pay a finder's fee. I'll draft a contract. Well, I'm afraid you'll uh, have to submit an invoice when your work's done. So, do we have a deal? Champagne! Not for me. But you have to. We are celebrating. Celebrating what? Why, bad news from the hospital. There are secondary growths in my liver. Oh, hell. Mm. Well, it's one of those moments in life when he, you do rather focus on the nice things. This, this champagne. Mm. The blueness of the sky. The radiant beauty of a young woman. Forgive me, I... Do not leer. I merely admire. That's okay. So, our time together is limited. Please sit down. You have a book to finish. We can wait. It cannot wait. Well, ask away. What can you tell me about Emile Lacan? Uh. 1898 to 1951, born in Paris, a realist artist in the Sicket tradition, at odds with modernism, never became fashionable. His value at auction is minimal. He painted a piece called Low Life, which was... It was stolen from the Van Rijn Museum two and a half years ago. Did you steal it? I did, actually. Or rather, I, I briefed the robbers. They were instructed to leave the Rembrandts, masterpieces all, but impossible to sell. But the treasures in the basement were precious enough. A Chagall tapestry, a lovely de Kooning, and the Lacan. But why? The Lacan isn't valuable. Eh? There is, I have to tell you, a thriving market for paintings like the Lacan. At a conservative estimate, about £20 million, if you know the right collector. <sighs> I find that hard to believe. Do you know the piece? I've seen the catalogue photograph. It's... It's a murder scene. A prostitute has been stabbed to death on a bed and her intestines have been ripped out. Her silent scream is evocative of Mook, but far more disturbing. Well, yes, I thought it was rather vivid, but hardly... It has a powerful history, for it is painted from life. The car, you see was a serial killer of prostitutes with influential friends who protected him from the authorities. And this was one of his victims. The case was notorious at the time. Lacan killed her, then painted her, then fled. The painting was kept secret for 50 years, but the rumours about it were legion. And then a small French museum acquired the painting, not knowing its history. And from there, it passed to the Van Rijn. And I just had to have it. But who on earth would buy a piece with a history like that? There is a small coterie of rich collectors who prize such items. Such items? There's a Michelangelo crucifixion, also painted from life. The great artist in pursuit of truth nailed a boy to a cross hmm, and then painted him as he died. Those were dark times and cruel people. The Michelangelo is now in the home of a Swiss billionaire. I've seen it. Snuff paintings. I regret bitterly ever getting involved in that affair. My team of robbers were betrayed. A rival gang held them at gunpoint and stole the paintings. I have no idea where the Nakai is now. Andrew Gerald thinks you have it. Yes, I deduce from the tenor of these questions. 
<laughs> He's offered you a bribe? A hefty one. I turned him down. Don't lie to me, Jessica. I'm not. You didn't say yes, but you didn't say no either, did you? I ended my conversation with Gerald with an ambiguous silence. Oh, signifying yes. Yes. Then you're a fool. Andrew's a ruthless and dangerous man. He doesn't like loose ends. But his insurance company. There is no insurance company. Gerald's working on his own behalf. The man's a crook, and I should know. I've been paying him bribes for 20 years. But... You've done a deal with the devil, my sweet dear. And if Andrew Gerald ever thinks that you're a threat to him, if he thinks for one moment that you know too much, he will have you killed. <laughs> Chapter 16 This was one of the most remarkable heists of the century. I love it. I adore the crackler. At 8 a.m., security guards at the Chicago Museum of Modern Art made a routine patrol of the gallery. Nothing was amiss. You can date an oil painting from the way the paint is cracked. A 17th century piece looks under the microscope like a dried up mud puddle. A 19th century painting looks more like an alligator's hide. At 10 a.m., the gallery opened and a dozen paintings and two sculptures were missing. Two Matisse, three Modiglianis, a Picasso, a Brac, two Brancusis, a Filonov, three George Gross and a Miro, the pride of the collection. And it's my favorite part of the process. After months of painting and varnishing and baking the damn thing in an oven, hoping it won't burn or melt, you take the now priceless work of art and you crack it crack against your knee. <laughs> no better method in my view. The security guards were, it was discovered, body doubles of the real security guards who were being held captive. And the CCTV had been sabotaged to play old images of the gallery to the guards in the control room. Sometimes... The crackleur looks wrong, and I have to bin the whole damn thing. It makes for nail-biting suspense. The artworks were chosen with care, and police at the time argued that an art dealer had been part of the robbery team. I can now reveal... I love the technical side of forgery. Aging the canvas, grinding up lapis lazuli to make real ultramarine, or recreating 18th century lead, tin yellow, or Tyrian purple... My favourite trick is mixing modern pigments with ancient ones to make it look as if the old master's been incompetently restored. <laughs> oh, the buggers always fall for that. That Daniel Ballantyne was the brains behind this robbery. As well as being a master forger, Ballantyne was... It's all a game, really. A master criminal. Oh, I can't write this crap, then. It's pure cliché. No, it's great. Keep going. You're writing a bestseller, remember? I know, but... And you're doing this for us, right? <sighs> the act of forgery itself, however, that's entirely different. In what way? It's a kind of <coughs> uh, spiritual transformation, I suppose. Because to paint like someone else, you have to see the world as they do. When I did my Picassos, I lived and breathed Picasso. I dressed like him, I womanized. Uh, I spoke Spanish to my paramours. I forgot myself and became the mad Spaniard. Method painting. Indeed, when I wanted to forge the wrath. I'm turning the recorder off now. This is all bullshit. Uh, You're a mimic. Pastiche comes naturally to you. You don't need to be the painter. Well, I did drink rather a lot when I was doing the Jackson Pollock. You've never painted a Jackson Pollock. True. This is my problem. You sit there and talk and just rubbish comes out. Plausible rubbish. You told me your middle name is Dali. It's not. Just having a bit of fun. You just say things without meaning them. All the stuff you told me about your childhood, your mother's drinking, your father in jail. I, I found no corroboration for any of it. It's all fantasy. Mm, yes, but it makes for a better story, doesn't it? That's not the point. But I thought it was the point. You know, a bit of squalor porn for the sake of our readers. Some insight into the psychology of the master forger. You are intending to call me a master forger, aren't you? Of course not. Oh, well, that's a relief. 
And all that stuff about Andrew Jarrell. He's a very dangerous man. No, he's not. You lied about that too. He does work for an insurance company. They do have a reward for the return of the Lacan. And the biggest lie of all, you confessed to murdering Gilbert Reynolds. But when I spoke to Claire Devere, she told me it was suicide. What's wrong with you, Daniel? Why do you find it so hard to tell the truth? <laughs> Good question. Well, hard to say, really. Um, habit. Maybe some childhood trauma. Or perhaps my alcoholic mother oh, used to feed me gold gin from the bottle when you, I was I'm just a baby. I'm not listening. You know, I'd love to paint you, Jessica. What, naked? Are you coming on to me? Not naked. Angry. I love to paint you angry. Why? Because you go red in the face. It's rather amusing. I do not go <laughs> red in the face. And when you laugh also. <laughs> wait, wait. Don't move. Let me sketch you. What, now? Yes, now. May I? Yes. Don't look at me. Look beyond me. Raise your chin. That's it. He seduced you, hasn't he? Not at all. In fact, if anything... What? I'm finding him annoying. He can be very annoying. And self-absorbed. Totally self-absorbed. He has a very high opinion of himself. With good cause. He's the most gifted forger I've ever encountered. You're protecting him, aren't you? Of course not. I offered you a perfectly good deal, £100,000, just to get a painting for me, and you've lied to me about it. I have not lied. Quote, she, did you steal it? He, I did actually, or rather I briefed the robbers. They were instructed to leave the Rembrandts. Clear admission of guilt, wouldn't you say? And yet last week you told me that Ballantyne had nothing to do with the blasted Van Rijn robbery. I uh, exaggerated. No, you lied. Why? You owe nothing to this man. He's a thief who hires armed robbers to do his dirty work. And you're shielding him. Why? He... I... I, I don't know. Is it because you believe that deep down he really cares about you, eh? Deep down you matter to him. Deep down he thinks you're the smartest and most discerning woman in the world. Don't mock me. The fact of the matter is, deep down, he's full of crap. Maybe you're right. How did you know what Ballantyne said? I installed recording equipment in Ballantyne's studio. Okay. Then you know everything I know. He claims he planned and participated in the Van Rijn robbery, but he doesn't have the Emile Lacan, and I can't prove any different. Of course he has it. Well, he denies it. And he also claims Lacan was a serial killer who painted his dying victims. Is that true? Who cares? Ballantyne has the Lacan and I want it. So go to him and tell him. It's the painting or else. Or else what? Sorry, you haven't a clue, have you? You stupid little tart. Don't talk to me like... Oh, hell. It's me, uh, Ben. I'm not here at... Ben, ben turn even that your is... bloody oh, mobile sorry. on! We're nearly there, love. Ben! Take that. It's too much, love. Take it! It's only a painting. It's not worth all this. I thought it was blood. 
a body's worth of blood all over our bed. The phone had been disconnected. The flat was, there was a table knocked over and a lamp was broken as if there'd been a struggle. But then I looked at the bed again and realized someone had covered it with a polythene sheet. You know, like a dust sheet and the carpet too. You don't do that. But Ben's okay. Ben's okay. Pissed off with me, I think. He spent the afternoon with an art dealer. An East Ender, very working class, but he knew all the jargon. He told Ben he was a genius and that he deserved to be up there with the Hursts and the Emmins. Ben fell for it, hook, line and whatever. And of course he had his mobile turned off. But just chance of a lifetime. Even Ben isn't that much of a klutz. He had his phone turned off. And the blood was paint. Scarlet. The colour of an El Greco robe. I'm so sorry for involving you in my petty vendetta. Do you have this damn painting? Yes, of course. Then give it to him. Why should I? Because. Please, Daniel. Do this for me. So charming a plea from one so beautiful. I say again, why should I? Because if you don't, I'll tell the police you have the Lacan and that you were involved in the Van Rijn Museum. I confess to many more robberies than that and they can't send me to jail, remember? Death is at my heels. Plod doesn't get a look in. Then I, I don't know why. Maybe because, because you like me. Ah, now there we have it. I like you. I'm besotted with you, in other words. That's what Gerald believes, isn't it? Otherwise, his threat would have no value. He must believe that I actually care what happens to you. And do you? Not a bit. I've used you, Jessica, right from the start. I paid Gerald to tell you I murdered Gilbert Reynolds, even though it was not so. I've told you numerous other stories of my evil deeds, some true, but many of them false. And I've done all this because a long time ago, I lost my heart and my humanity to that vain bitch posterity. I would be loved. Failing that, I would be hated. But I must be remembered. Pathetic, isn't it? Yes, it is. But I'll give Gerald a damn painting. And not for your sake, but because I don't want it anymore. It's a piece of evil that deserves to be in the company of evil people. I'm done with it. You're a loathsome piece of shit, aren't you? Now that's better. That's a far more objective judgment. Where is the Lacan? I painted over it to conceal it from the world. But it will be easy enough to remove my own daubs and find the horror that lies underneath. It's here, under one of these canvases. It was here, then I gave it to you. The painting you took from me, remember? My inept yet original Daniel Ballantyne. That is the Lacan. I kind of like the bedroom like that. Blood spattered. It's a great look. There's no real damage done. I'll dump the polythene sheet tomorrow. How's it coming? Almost there. I've prepared the surface, just started wiping off the new paint. Why aren't we calling the police, by the way? I'd rather just forget about the whole affair. And is there really a stolen masterpiece under all this ghastliness? A masterpiece? No. But if it's the Lacan, it's worth 20 million at least. No questions asked. Cool. Where's Gerald? He should be here by now. Here we go. Oops, that's naughty. It's a painting of a dead woman, eviscerated. Well, those are viscera, but that's no woman. Keep rubbing. I'm rubbing. This is not the Lacan. That's a digital clock. That's 70s wallpaper. What is it then? That's the disemboweled corpse of Andrew Gerald. Chapter 20. There are so many more questions I would love to have asked Daniel Ballantyne. He was a complex, contradictory, but charismatic man. I value the time we spent together in the months before his tragic death.
Interview with Andrew Jarold commences at 14.43. Officers present are Detective Inspector Grimwood and Detective Sergeant Rookley. Ballantyne was a joker, a clown. His parting gift to me was a portrait of one of his deadliest enemies, Andrew Jarold, naked, eviscerated and dead. No comment. Wait for the questions, please. In fact, Andrew Jarold is very much alive. However, a day before Ballantyne's death, an anonymous informant contacted the police and told them that Gerald was harbouring stolen paintings. Brian, do the honours. Yes, Gov. <clears throat> DS Ruckley is now showing Mr Gerald a Chagall tapestry, which we believe to be the property of the Van Rijn Museum in Amsterdam. Now, we found this under your floorboards, Andrew. Can you account for that? Someone planted it there. Daniel Ballantyne. He has it in for me. Then, how do you account for the fact that, at the time we arrested you, Ballantyne was in an ambulance on its way to the Chelsea Hospital? I can't. You know me, Douglas. You know my reputation. Would I be that stupid? So, you admit you're a thief, Andrew, but you wish to be considered a clever thief? Don't. Don't you dare. I was a copper when you still had bum fluff. Don't you get sarcastic with me. D.S. Ruckley is now showing Mr. Gerald a painting which we believe is by Willem de Kooning. Also stolen from the Van Rijn Museum in Amsterdam. To the old rogue. The old rogue. I'll miss him. Jess, he was a crook. I know, but... At least his timing was good. You finished your last chapter. I think that was all that was keeping him alive. Except... Except what? Oh, I just can't believe it. That he's really dead. Open casket, Jess. His body was riddled with cancer. He's dead, all right. I know. I saw him in his coffin. Even dead, he looked as if he was mocking the whole world. Ah, oh, this is such a lovely spot, Mr. Pisakis. It's why I have my living room on the first floor. Whistler used to live a few doors down, you know. Yes, I know. Let me see the Lacan. Of course. How will I know it's genuine? You know my reputation. Everyone knows that Marchmont Banks can be relied upon. Besides, there are plenty of curators who will authenticate it. No questions asked. Any problems? And, of course, I'll refund the purchase price. Fair. At 10 a.m. the gallery opened and a dozen paintings and two sculptors were missing. Two Matisse, three Modigliani's and a Picasso. The security guard's were, it was discovered. That uh, bastard, Ballantyne, is dead, you know. Mm, so I've heard. For collectors like myself, it was a plague. I bought two of his rascals. Ah, very galling. How much for this Lecon? Mm, these are difficult times, you know, even for someone like myself. Her name was Mary. She was a prostitute. Lecon left a diary. I have it. He describes how he took her home, how he had her, how he killed her. Look, look at the painting and look hard. The room is cold. And that is breath coming out of her mouth. She's alive. He's ripped her open and she's still alive. How much, Mr. Pisakis? Name your price. Damn, damn, damn. The security guards were, it was discovered, body doubles of the real security guards. Hello? I was given this number. It belongs to Daniel Ballantyne. No, Jessica. Daniel, you're alive. Yes, I know I am, my dear. Charge me or let me go. I'm now showing Mr. Jarrell the bank records for an account he holds with the Royal National Bank. Now, as you can see, Andrew, 
your two million pounds in credit. That's not possible. Look, do you deny that this is your bank account? <laughs> no, but Ballantyne did this. He transferred the money into my account. He's cut my throat. Good Lord, what is that thing you're wearing? Oh, my toupee. <laughs> there we are, that's better. Oh, I can feel the air on my bald pate. And shave your head. Every day to give that chemo chic. But the coughing. There were times I thought you'd choke to death. I'm allergic to dogs, but every night I slept with a borrowed German shepherd. Oh. <laughs> and the body double? His name was George. I met him just before my trial. I spent six months on remand, you see, in squalor, and I thought, sod this. So I hired George to be me. A little bit of plastic surgery, hair transplant, and I taught him to talk like me. I have a persona, you see. The voice, the beard, the piercing stare. That makes me very easy to replicate. How did you... Uh, the Chicago heist. I was rereading my chapters. I used body doubles. Makeup, body language, wigs. It was good enough to fool their mate in the control room who'd worked with them for three years. That planted the clue. George did two years in jail for me. And then, shortly after his release, he called me and said he was dying of cancer. Hmm. Well, I gave him another million. It was the least I could do. And then I had this idea. It was George who attended the cancer clinic? Yes. <laughs> Idi Amin had one too, you know. Presidents have them. And, of course, when the police seized my assets, they did miss rather a lot. How rich are you, Daniel? Not rich enough. I'm building a museum, you see. I have a place in Switzerland I want to take my stolen artworks out of storage, my Rembrandt, my Cimabue, and my two Raphaels, put them on the walls and spend my last days surrounded by genius. And why did you frame Andrew Gerald? Because he tried to frighten you, my dear, and I thought it my duty to protect you. Yeah, what is it? A tip, Gov, anonymous informant. A billionaire art collector called Stavros Pasakis just bought a stolen painting by Emil Lacan. Did you trace the call? Uh, yeah, mobile phone. The call was standing on Victoria Bankman. Phone's probably in the river by now. Nice try, but I don't believe you. You always planned to frame Gerald. That's true. Why? Because he double-crossed me. I bought Andrew Gerald lock, stock and polyester suit ten years ago. We had an arrangement. I stole the paintings. He ransomed them back to the insurance companies. Then I did the Van Ryan Museum raid just before my unfortunate arrest. And after the robbery... My two associates betrayed me. They beat me up, they beat me up. And they stole the van full of paintings, except for the Lacan. I'd already hidden that, and I knew, I just knew that Andrew Gerald was behind it. But I couldn't prove it, so I bided my time. I bought the stolen paintings and the Chagall tapestry back from various illicit dealers. And then I left them in his flat under the floorboards. That must have cost you millions. Indeed, but you have no idea how many Picassos and Monets I've daubed and sold over the years. But it was never about the money, Jessica. But you still have the Lacan? No, I destroyed that two years ago. But I do have a dozen forgeries of it, and I continue to sell it around the world. My little joke. <laughs> Are you going to tell the police about me, dear? The fact that I'm still alive? I, I, I have to. Oh, dear. Are you going to answer that? Don't you dare! Hush, my dear. Or I will assuredly shoot you. Jess, honey, I've got an invite for a private view tonight. Free drinks, canapes, 
we can gorge ourselves and save on food bills for another month. Call me when you get this. Love you. Big kiss. Slurp, slurp. Bye. He errs on the side of Kitch, does he not? Give me my phone back. Stavros Pasakis, I'm arresting you on suspicion of theft. You do not have this to This is an anything. outrage. I bought this painting legitimately. Gov, look. The woman on the bed. She's still breathing. Poor devil's still breathing. It's just a painting. Did you really think that I would let myself be caught and go to jail? No, of course not. Look, you win. Just lock me in this flat and you can make your getaway. Oh, no, that's a good idea. And it'll make a fabulous chapter for your book. Yes. But it does leave me rather vulnerable. You see, as it stands, I'm a dead man. I can move without trace. I can begin again. You jeopardize all that. I won't tell anyone about you. Really? Why are you sweating, my dear? Do you really think I'm the sort of deranged psychopath who would murder a sweet little thing like you? No, of course not. Why did you come here, Jessica? What did you want from me? The... the truth. You're wearing a wire, aren't you? Yes. Take it off. <sighs> Give me the memory card, please. Thank you. Um, please, put your brows back on. Ah, this is what you will do. You will write the book exactly as I dictated it to you. You will not include any stories of how Daniel Ballantyne was a thwarted genius. You will write about the lovable rogue, the cheeky chappy. You will not mention the lacan. You write a lovely book. And then you'll send it to me. I'll give you a P.O. box number. Don't pass it to the police. Those are my terms. If you disobey me, I will frame you and destroy you. And you know that I can do that. Are we agreed? That's fine. Fine. No problem. Then we have a deal. We have a deal. <laughs> Good. You're safe. Your book will make money. Ben will slather you with kisses on a regular basis. And I'll sit in my lair surrounded by masterpieces and cackle. Yes. Yes. Or, uh, if you prefer... I do have an alternative plan. What's that? Come with me. In The Art of Deception by Philip Palmer, Jessica was played by India Ravama, Valentine by David Schofield, Gerald by Jonathan Keeble, and Ben by Matt Addis. Claire de Vere was Belinda Lang, Stavros Pasakis, Malcolm Tierney, Grimwood, John Biggins, Ruckley, Benjamin Askew, and the museum curator, Philip Fox. The director was Toby Swift.